Surrey manager Vanessa Harfaker showed us round one of the National Autistic Society's residential homes. Purpose-built, calm, ordered, with neutral decor and clear light spaces, it's a haven for people who find the outside world, right. quite literally, too much. Right, we're now in Jan Norton. Again, we have another board which explains which staff are on shift. And then through here, we have the lounge area. That is the noise she makes. That's actually a happy noise. I only know that obviously through, <laughs> through years of working with her. You can tell when she's distressed, the noise is slightly different. And again, the staff are fully aware of what each of the noises mean. Um, and she's got a teach book in her hand, which has got pictures of activities and things that she likes. And she'll be pointing to the different symbols to show the staff what she wants as well. She's nonverbal. Selena has always managed to live independently. Her difficulties are much less extreme, but no less disturbing. If I'm really distressed, I can't speak. I can't speak and feel at the same time. It's like this great feeling that gets in my body and, and some strong emotion is just more than I can cope. We have this single word, autism, describing a very wide spectrum of manifestations. And it's true that in the high-functioning individuals, and those with Asperger's syndrome, those with good language, for example, there could be lots of um, opportunities and, you know, they can make a terrific contribution to society. But we've got that same word that's also being used for someone who may sit in the corner rocking back and forth with no language and no measurable IQ. It could be so low. People end up here because of their level of need. They obviously need structure, clear structure, to get through the day. For one particular individual, the rituals became so great that they would take perhaps up to six hours to get ready. And some of the individuals that live here, they weren't diagnosed later on in life. Um, sometimes it's when the behaviours become too bad. You know, it could be end of teenage years. It could be even later than that. I left school at the age of 15. I got in trouble with the police because I felt so angry and upset and deeply distressed. I was also suffering with extreme depression and anxiety. And I was an inpatient in a psychiatric hospital for a year, diagnosed as psychotic, put on a whole cocktail of severe antidepressants, antipsychotic medication. And there was never any kind of understanding of my condition. I don't think at the time, hardly anything was known of high-functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome. It's the complex, enigmatic nature of autism that first attracted Dr Francesca Happe, Professor of Cognitive Psychology at King's College, London. I think it's very important to distinguish between not being able to read somebody's mind and not caring what somebody feels. And we've done some research that shows that these two things are really very distinct. Sometimes when I talk about Asperger's syndrome to groups of clinicians or psychiatrists, they might say, well, are you describing what it's like to be a sociopath or a psychopath, somebody who really doesn't care about other people, who treats people as objects and hurts them? And I try to make it very clear that I'm not saying that, and that really isn't true. People on, with Asperger's syndrome are no more likely than you or I to do psychopathic and unpleasant things. What they find difficult to understand is when somebody is experiencing uh, in a state that is different from what they would experience. I don't have the ability to put onto my face, my facial expression, the distress that I feel. I have to act it, I have to work it. So it, the self-harming was a way of trying to desperately externalise the internal distress of being in this prison that somehow I could never get out of. So this song is called Playgrounds as Battlefields. Whenever I play, I always close my eyes because I can't look and play at the same time. <laughs> You laugh at me Because I am different Well I laugh at you Because you're all the same This is the Lorna Wing Centre for Autism, Elliot House in Bromley. Doctors Lorna Wing and Judith Gould have been at the forefront of research into autism since the 1970s. They now run the National Autistic Society Diagnostic Centre on the outskirts of London. They train health practitioners to recognise and diagnose the condition, and they're seeing more and more adult referrals. 
We're an ordinary house, deliberately so. When we set up in 1991, we didn't want it to be a medical environment, so that families who come here feel they're just coming to somebody's home. After all, my world's under glass. The schedules designed to diagnose were child-based because autism is a developmental disorder and therefore you really should have an informant who can tell you the early history of the individual. But of course now we're seeing adults, their baby parents aren't around or the adult themselves don't wish their parents to be involved. So what we've done, we've adapted the DISCO, the Diagnostic Interview for Social and Communication Disorders, to asking questions that are relevant for the adults. So how we diagnose is through the current behaviour of the person, how they are now. Deep inside me there's a midnight garden our favourite saying here is that nature never draws a line without smudging it. So the individuals we see, we look at them as a person because you have to understand the concepts behind each of these questions, which is part of the training. Just trying to find my way home. Their diagnostic test of 600 questions forms the basis of a day of interviews and observation. Professor Baron Cohen's developed an online questionnaire for screening the general population. To help our understanding, my producer and I thought we should try answering the 50 multi-choice questions. We developed uh, a questionnaire called the Autism Spectrum Quotient, the AQ. People can fill it in for themselves. And it simply measures autistic traits. And this is a relatively new idea that autistic traits might run right through the population. So it's not just in the people that have a diagnosis, but we all have some autistic traits, and that you might be able to quantify that, you know, see how many you have. Me being a man and my producer Sarah being a woman, would you expect us to have really quite different kinds of answers on these, whether we're on the autism spectrum or no? If you look at individuals, uh, like you and Sarah, what we're interested in is not what sex you are, but what kind of brain do you have? In fact, we wondered only because when, when you look at the first sheets, for instance, and I realise this is a very unscientific way for us to look at it, and you'll look at it in a much more scientific way, but those first sheets, the circles around what we definitely agree with or definitely disagree with are very different. Yeah. This isn't for diagnosis. We use it for research to see if we're, for example, looking at aspects of brain function. Does it correlate with your score in terms of number of autistic traits? If we're looking at your hormone levels, does it correlate with your score? So it has a research value. And it's also a screening instrument for seeing whether it's an appropriate referral to a clinic. It's thought as few as one in ten people with autistic spectrum disorder is female. But that may be because clinicians have tended to regard women as less likely to have it. In Cambridge, Professor Baron Cohen is investigating how development in the womb might be influenced by levels of hormones such as testosterone, a theory that autism is partly a manifestation of an extreme male brain. So we've been looking at boys and girls whose mothers had amniocentesis, where some of the fluid is taken from around the fetus. And we've been looking at levels of hormone, particularly testosterone, in the amniotic fluid, and then waiting for the baby to be born, and looking to see if there's any relationship between the level of the hormone in the womb and how the child turns out. What we're finding is that the higher your fetal testosterone levels, the less eye contact you make as a toddler, and also the slower you are to develop language. So these are just our first steps at trying to understand some of the biology of social development. And we'll be taking this forward to look at whether people who end up with a diagnosis of autism may have elevated levels of fetal testosterone.